Richard, I have had a lifelong deep desire to understand what God is. And as much as I've read, many people refer to your definition of God. And I come to you to understand, as you put it so eloquently, the person picked out by this name, God. Yes, what I'm going to describe to you is the traditional view uh, by Christianity, Judaism, Islam, of what God is like. It's also the kind of God to which my arguments lead. Um, God is clearly supposed to be a personal being in the sense of someone with whom we interact. And a person is someone with powers. I'm a person because I can do certain things. God can do certain things, but his powers are infinite, so he's omnipotent, he can do anything. Uh, I'm what Part of me being a person is that I've got certain beliefs about the world. Uh, God has beliefs about the world, but he has all true beliefs, so he knows everything, he is omniscient. Uh, I can make choices between alternatives, that's part of what makes me a person, so in that sense I have a certain amount of freedom. Uh, but, of course, I'm influenced by irrational desires of various kinds, so my freedom is limited. He has perfect freedom. He is not influenced by irrational desires or anything outside himself. So he is a personal being who is omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly free. Anything lasts for a certain amount of time. I last for a certain amount of time. God uh, lasts for an infinite amount of time, and I prefer to construe that as saying he's everlasting. He exists at all moments of past time, exists now, and will exist at all moments of future time. Though there is another way of construing that in the tradition of saying that he exists outside time. But however you construe this, let's say he's eternal. But for the, from these characteristics of God, omnipotence, omniscience, and perfect freedom and eternity, there follow all the other traditional attributes of God. For example, um, God is supposed to be perfectly good. Now, given that he is omniscient, he will know what things are good and what things are bad. And given that he's perfectly free, he will be not influenced to do anything except which is what is he believes to be good. And since he's omniscient, he will have true beliefs about what is good. Recognizing something as good gives you a reason for doing it, a motivation for doing it, and unless you're deterred by irrational desires, you will do it. So God will be perfectly good because he's not influenced by irrational desires. He sees what is good and he will do it. Uh, it's a necessary moral truth that we have some, oblig uh, some obligation to conform to the wishes of our benefactors. If someone is very generous and gives us a present which we don't decline, that gives us certain obligations to them. And more fundamentally, children have great obligations to their parents because their parents are the source of their being, nurture, upbringing. But God is so much more the source of our being than our parents. He kept, keeps us alive every moment of our existence, gives us all the good things we have and the abilities of parents themselves to give us good things are due to God. So we have great obligations to God. In virtue of that, he is the source of moral obligation. He can tell us to do things, and that will create a duty on us to do things. God is omnipresent. He is present everywhere. And what that means is he's present by his powers and knowledge. That's to say he's aware of everything that's happening everywhere, and he can make a difference to everything that's happening everywhere. And it follows from his omnipotence that he has the ability to act at places, not indirectly by sending a radio signal there, but directly. And it follows from his omniscience that he knows what's going on everywhere. His knowledge isn't dependent on light rays coming from there. So he's omnipresent. Uh, if there is a universe, it follows that it only, because he's omnipotent, it follows that it only exists because he allows it to exist. And in that sense, he is the creator of any universe there is. This is compatible with him delegating, allowing someone else to create a universe, but the general view is that uh, he's directly responsible, but I don't think that's a very important doctrine, as it were. The point is, whatever happens is he allows to happen, whether he delegates his power sometimes or not. So the traditional properties of God follow from the ones I've mentioned, 
The ones I mentioned do have to be spelt out a bit carefully. Um, omnipotence, does this mean that he can make two and two make five, or change the past, or make me exist and not exist at the same time? The traditional answer is no. Uh, and Aquinas uh, spelt out that traditional answer. There's, there's a famous uh, uh, question in the Summa Contra Gentiles, in title, a work of Aquinas's, entitled How an Omnipotent God is Unable to Do Many Things, and <laughs> the many things include the ones I've mentioned. Um, now, so what one says is that he is om his being omnipotent is his ability to do anything logically possible, anything which doesn't involve a contradiction, and supposing he could make me exist and not exist at the same time involves a contradiction, so he can't do that. But then it begins to look as if I, if I say he's omnipotent means he can do anything logically possible. It suggests he's not really omnipotent at all because there's some things he can't do. But that's a bit misleading because the weakness in God's inability to make me exist and not exist at the same time is not an inability, a weakness in God. It's an inability in a human sentence. Uh, make me exist and not exist at the same time. It looks as if it's describing anything, but it isn't describing anything at all because it doesn't make sense to suppose there would be anything that satisfies that description. So God can do anything. That is the correct way to describe God's omnipotence, but not every human sentence. It looks as if it might describe a state of affairs, really does. So you can summarize that by saying you can do anything logically possible, but that's a bit misleading for the way I've given, the reason I've given. I, I find fascinating that you have defined God on, on different levels and some follow from the others. So at the deeper levels are more fundamental. And yes. You've defined omnipotence, omniscience, all power, all knowledge, and being perfectly free as the three primary yeah, characters, yeah. like primary colors, yeah. and out of those you derive some of the yeah. others. But I find equally fascinating that below that, where you started, was God as a person. And that was the first thing that you said. And so indeed, in your conceptualization of God, is that the most fundamental thing, so that God is a person, then you build the omnipotence, the omniscience, and the perfectly free out of that? I'm happy with that description. Uh, what I'm describing is the simplest sort of person there could be. Uh, and so, yes, you start with a person, and then you say, well, a person to create the universe has obviously got to be very powerful and very knowledgeable and very free. He wouldn't be able to create the universe otherwise. So the only issue is, does he have very great but limited power, very many true beliefs but some false ones, and so on. And it's far simpler to suppose there are zero limits than to suppose there are some large finite limits. And so, yes, I do start from the notion of person, and I try and describe the simplest kind of person there could be. To be a person, you have to have powers, beliefs, and uh, a freedom of choice of some sort. And what you do at your third level, uh, perfect goodness, God is created, to take two examples, are not directly de derived from the primary level of person, but are secondarily derived from these powers. Yes, from the ki simplest kind of person there could be, is what it, what it follows from, <laughs> yes.